Now, taking our cues from the Buchanan, the Ron Paul, and the Trump movement onto the specifics of a populist strategy for libertarian change. In no particular order, except for the very first one, which has currently assumed the greatest urgency in the public mind. One, stop mass immigration. The waves of immigrants currently flooding, flooding the Western world have burdened it with hordes of welfare parasites, brought in terrorists, increased crime, led to the proliferation of no-go areas and resulted in countless bad neighbors who, based on their alien upbringing, culture and tradition, lack any understanding and appreciation of liberty and are bound to become mindless future supporters of welfare statism. No one is against immigration and immigrants per se, but immigration must be by invitation only. All immigrants must be productive people and hence be barred from all domestic welfare payments. To ensure this, they or their inviting party must place a bond with a community in which they are to settle and which is to be forfeited and lead to the immigrant's deportation should he ever become a public burden. As well, every immigrant, inviting party or employer should not only pay for the immigrant's upkeep or salary, but must also pay the residential community for the additional wear and tear of its public facilities that is associated with the immigrant's presence, so as to avoid the socialization of any and all costs incurred with his settlement. Moreover, even before the admission, Every potential immigrant invitee must be carefully screened and tested not only for his productivity, but also for cultural affinity or good laborliness, with the empirically predictable result of mostly, but, no means, but by no means exclusively, Western white immigrant candidates. And any known communist or socialist of any color, denomination, or country of origin must be barred from permanent settlement unless that is the community where he, the potential immigrant wants to settle officially sanctions the looting of its residence property by new foreign arrivals, which is not very likely, to say the least, even with already existing commie communities. Now, a brief message to all open border and liberalala libertarians, who will surely label this, you guessed it, as fascist. Now, in a fully privatized libertarian social order, there exists no such thing as a right to free immigration. Private property implies borders and the owner's right to exclude at will. And public property has borders as well. It is not unowned property. It is the property of domestic taxpayers and most definitely not the property of foreigners. And while it is true that the state is a criminal organization and that to entrust it with a task of border control will inevitably result in numerous injustices to both domestic residents and foreigners, it is also true that the state does something when it decides not to do anything about border control. And that under the present circumstances, if the state would not do anything about border control, um, that this will lead to even more and much graver injustices, in particular to the domestic citizenry, than any other policy. Two, stop attacking, killing, and bombing people in foreign countries. A main cause, even if by no means the only one, of the current invasion of Western countries by hordes of alien immigrants are the wars initiated and conducted in the Middle East and elsewhere by the United States, ruling elites and their subordinate Western puppet elites. As well, the by now seemingly normal and ubiquitous terrorist attacks in the name of Islam across the Western world are in large measure a blowback of these wars and the ensuing chaos throughout the Middle East and Northern Africa. There should be no hesitation on our part 
to call these Western rulers responsible for this, for what they really are, murderers or accessories to mass murder. We must demand and cry out loud instead for a foreign policy of strict non-interventionism. Withdraw from all international and supranational organizations such as the United Nations, NATO and the, United, and the European Union that intricate one country into the domestic affairs of another. Stop all government to government aid and prohibit all weapon sales to foreign states. Let it be America first, England first, Germany first, Italy first, Turkey first, and smaller Bavaria first, uh, and uh, uh, Veneto first, and so forth. Um, each country trading with one another, and no one interfering in anyone, anyone else's domestic affairs. Three, defund the ruling elites and its intellectual bodyguards. Expose and widely publicize the lavish salaries, perks, pensions, side deals, bribes, and hush monies received by the ruling elites, by the higher ups in government and governmental bureaucracies of supreme courts, central banks, secret services, and spy agencies, by politicians, parliamentarians, party leaders, political advisors and consultants, by crony capitalist public educrats, university presidents, provosts, and academic stars. Drive home the point that all of their shining glory and luxury is funded by money extorted from taxpayers and consequently urge that any and all taxes be slashed. Income taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, inheritance taxes, and on and on. Four, end the Fed and all central banks. The second source of funding for the ruling elites, besides the money extorted from the public in the form of taxes, comes from the central banks. Central banks are allowed to create paper money out of thin air. This reduces the purchasing power of money and destroys the savings of average people. It does not and cannot make society as a whole richer, but it redistributes income and wealth within society. The earliest receiver of the newly created money that is usually the ruling elites are thereby made richer and the later and latest receiver that is the average citizen are made poorer. The central bank's manipulation of interest rates is the cause of boom-bust cycles. The central bank permits the accumulation of ever greater public debt that is shifted as a burden onto unknown future taxpayers or is simply inflated away. And as a facilitator of public debt, the central banks are also the facilitators of wars. This monstrosity must end and be replaced by a system of free, competitive banking built on the foundation of a genuine commodity money such as gold and silver. Five, abolish all affirmative action and non-discrimination laws and regulations. All such edicts are blatant violations of the principle of the equality before the law that at least in the West is intuitively sensed and recognized and as a fundamental principle of justice. As private property owners, people must be free to associate or disassociate with others, to include or to exclude, to integrate or to segregate, to join or to separate, to unify and incorporate, or to disunite, exit, and secede. Close all university departments for black, Latino, women, gender, queer studies, and so forth, as incompatible with science, and dismiss its faculties as intellectual imposters or scoundrels. As well, demand that all affirmative action commissars, diversity and human resource officers from universities on down to schools and kindergartens be thrown out onto the street and be forced to learn some useful trade. Six, crush the anti-fascist mob. The transvaluation of all values throughout the West, the invention of ever more victim groups, the spread of affirmative action programs 
and the relentless promotion of political correctness has led to the rise of an anti-fascist mob, tacitly supported and indirectly funded by the ruling elites, this self-described mob of social justice warriors has taken upon itself the task of escalating the fight against white privilege through deliberate acts of terror directed against anyone and anything deemed racist, right-wing, fascist, reactionary, incorrigible, or unreconstructed. Such enemies of progress are physically assaulted by the anti-fascist anti mob, their cars are burned down, their properties are vandalized, and their employers are threatened to dismiss them and ruin their careers. All the while, the police are ordered by the powers that be to stand down and not to investigate the crimes committed or persecute and punish the criminals. In view of this outrage, public anger must be aroused and there must be clamoring far and wide for the police to be unleashed and this mob beaten into submission. Now, a query again for liberal -la libertarians and the stupids for liberty, who are sure to object to this demand on the ground that the police asked to crush the anti-fascist mob are state police. Question to them, do you also object on the same grounds that the police arrest murderers or rapists? Aren't these legitimate tasks performed also in a libertarian order by private police? And if the police are not allowed to do anything about this mob, isn't it okay then that the target of these attacks, namely the so-called racist right, should take the task upon itself and of giving the social justice warriors a bloody nose? Seven, crush the street criminals and gangs. In dispensing with the principle of the equality before the law and awarding all sorts of group privileges, except to the one group that I mentioned, the ruling elites have also dispensed with the principle of equal punishment for equal crime. Some state favored groups are handed more lenient punishment for the same crime than others. And some especially favored groups are simply let run wild and go practically unpunished at all, thus actually and effectively promoting crime. As well, no-go areas have been permitted to develop where any effort at law enforcement has essentially ceased to exist and where violent thugs and street gangs have taken over. In view of this, public furor must be provoked and it be unmistakably demanded that the police crack down quick and hard on any robber, mugger, rapist, and murderer and ruthlessly clear all current no-go areas of violent gang rule. Needless to say that this policy should be colorblind, but if it happens to be, as it in fact is, that most street criminals or gang members are young black or Latino males or in Europe, young immigrant males from Africa, the Middle East, the Balkans or Eastern Europe, then so be it. And such human specimen then should be the ones that most prominently get their noses bloodied. And needless to say also that in order to defend against crime, whether ordinary street crime or acts of terrorism, all prohibitions against the ownership of guns by upstanding citizens should be abolished. Eight, get rid of all welfare parasites and bums. To cement their own position, the ruling class has put the underclass on the dole and thus made it the most reliable source of public support. Allegedly to help people rise and move up from the underclass to become self-supporting actors, the real and actually intended effect of the state's so-called social policy is the exact opposite. It has rendered a person's underclass status more permanent and made the underclass permanently grow. And with this, of course, also the number of tax-funded social workers and therapists assigned to help and assist this group. For in accordance with exact with exact economic law, every subsidy awarded on account of some alleged need or deficiency produces more, not less, 
of the problem that it is supposed to alleviate or eliminate. Thus, the root cause of a person's underclass status, that is, his low impulse control and high time preference, that is, his uncontrolled desire for immediate gratification and the various attendant manifestations of this cause, such as permanent unemployment, poverty, alcoholism, drug abuse, domestic violence, divorce, female-headed households, out-of-wedlock births, rotating check-up male companions, child abuse, negligence and petty crime is and are not alleviated or eliminated but systematically strengthened and promoted. Instead of continuing and expanding the increasingly unsightly social disaster, it should be abolished and be loudly demanded that one takes heed of the biblical exhortation that he who can but will not work also shall not eat, and that he who truly cannot work due to severe mental or physical deficiencies be taken care of by family, community, and voluntary charity. Nine, get the state out of education. Most, if not all, social pathologies plaguing the contemporary West have their common root in the institution of public education. When the first steps were taken, well more than 200 years ago in Prussia to supplement and ultimately replace a formerly completely private system of education with a universal system of compulsory public education, the time spent in state-run schools did in most cases not exceed four years. Today, throughout the entire Western world, the time spent in institutions of public education is at a minimum around 10 years, in many cases, and increasingly so, 20 or even 30 years. That is, a large or even the largest part of time during the most formative period in a person's life is sp spent in state-funded and state-supervised institutions, whose primary purpose, from the very beginning, it was not to raise an enlightened public, but to train good soldiers and later on good public servants, not independent and mature mündige Bürger, but subordinate and servile Staatsbürger. The result? The indoctrination has worked. The longer the time a person has spent within the system of public education, the more he is committed to leftist egalitarian ideas and has swallowed and wholeheartedly internalized the official doctrine and agenda of political correctness. Indeed, in particular among social science teachers and professors, people not counting themselves as part of the left have practically ceased to exist. Consequently, it must be demanded that the control of schools and universities be wrest away from the central government and in the first step be returned to regional or better still local and locally funded authorities and ultimately be completely privatized so as, to, so as to replace a system of compulsory uniformity and conformity with a system of decentralized education that reflects the natural variation, multiplicity and diversity of human talents and interest. And ten and last, don't put your trust in politics and political parties. Just as academia and the academic world cannot be expected to play any significant role in a libertarian strategy for social change, so with politics and political parties. After all, it is the ultimate goal of libertarianism to put an end to all politics, and to, inter to subject all interpersonal relations and conflicts to private law and civil law procedures. To be sure, under present all pervasively politicized conditions and involvement in politics and party politics cannot be entirely avoided. However, any such involvement, in any such involvement one must be keenly aware of and guard against the corrupting influence of power and the lure of money and perks that comes with it. And to minimize the risk 
and temptation that comes from this, it is advisable to concentrate one's effort on the level of regional and local rather than national politics, and they are to promote a radical agenda of decentralization, of nullification and peaceful separation, segregation and secession. Most importantly, however, we must take heed of Ludwig von Mises' life motto, do not give in to evil, but proceed ever more boldly against it. That is, we must speak out whenever and wherever, whether in formal or in informal in gatherings, against anyone affronting us with the by now only all too familiar political correct drivel and left egalitarian balderdash and unmistakably say, no, hell no, you must be kidding. And in the meantime, given the almost complete mind control exercised by the ruling elites, academia and the mainstream media, it already acquires a good portion of courage to do that. But if we are not brave enough to do so now, and thus set an example for others to follow, matters will become increasingly worse and more dangerous in the future, and we, and Western civilization, and the Western ideas of freedom and liberty will be wiped out and vanish. Thank you very much. <laughs>